Thanks, Klaus and Adrian. Now, last but not least, please welcome Declan O'Shea, Global Product Manager, Isolation and Containment Systems, ILC Dover, UK, who's woken up early to address your questions on use of single-use aseptic isolator systems. Over to you, Declan. Hello, good morning, everybody. Sorry about that. I think we had some microphone issues. Um, so my name is Declan O'Shea. I'm the Product Manager for Isolator and Containment Systems at ILC Dover. Um, pretty much dealing with the, the product for any sort of high potency isolators as well as aseptic systems. So you know, I've got a vast amount of experience in the sterile manufacturing um, and sort of containment systems world. So hopefully I can answer any questions around uh, any queries or, or things that you'll have, namely around single use isolated systems as that is what we, uh, we kind of develop at ILC Dover. Uh, more over than anything else. You, before we do that, I'll take over a couple of slides, just to explain um, kind of the background of what we're seeing at the moment in the industry um, in regards to more highly potent substances running through sterile manufacturing, and then kind of any questions that follow that would be more than happy to answer. So what we're seeing at the moment is a, a large increase in higher potency pharmaceutical substances within the pharma space. Um, we've seen this growing over the past sort of 10 years or so. And, um, you know, now instead of seeing sort of 10 microgram substances, we're seeing nanogram substances um, running down to some of the most potent things that we see, like um, antibody drug conjugates, for instance. Um, you know, a lot of these are often looking down at sort of 10 nanograms down to one nanogram OEL um, potency levels, which are increasingly difficult to contain and to pass actual containment tests on. Um, but the, the potency of these, these molecules is not impossible. You know, we have proven it. But what that's finding, or what we are finding, um, as an isolator manufacturer, being a link in between uh, equipment and process, um, we are seeing this translate to the biopharmaceutical space as well. So we are seeing potent molecules or potent substances being handled within a fill-finish activity. Um, now, some of these are being categorized as maybe BSL levels before, um, but now we're seeing a more, um, let's say, a bigger link between pharma and biopharma, especially with things like the ADC, um, where you're linking a, a pharmaceutical drug product with a, a monoclonal antibody in order to, to create a, a cure. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're just seeing this more in the space, and that's what I kind of like to talk about. But, so, next slide. So basically, the way that we've looked at doing this with a lot of customers already is uh, via risk assessments. So pretty much what we've seen through the FDA sterile manufacturing guidelines, and as well with EN, <coughs> EU GMP Annex 1, they heavily lean towards a risk-based approach um, when you're undergoing any sort of sterile manufacturing. So realistically, yes, they have guidelines, and those are guidelines to stick by. Um, you've got your kind of solid guidelines, like your airflow speed, your particle count, your uh, zero bio uh, uh, biological growth. But then the way that you run your process is generally all very risk-based um, process run. So as long as you have uh, tried this in the past, you've run tests, done results, and then you've got a feel for your process and you can justify why you're doing something and you're doing it within the boundaries of these guidelines, then generally, um, what we've seen and the feedback we've got from auditors is that you can physically pro proceed with this, with this risk-based method. So pretty much one of the, the biggest things we see at the moment is what do we do when we're handling a potent substance inside of a clean room um, that's a liquid fill, for instance? You know, where do you take the risk of a liquid compared to a powder? You know, do you think that you have got zero risk there to your operation, to, to the operators or the product in the room? Um, and then do you want to operate the isolated system at a positive or a negative pressure? Realistically, with a potent product, you should really be operating under negative pressure just in case anything untoward is to happen and then you to pass this uh, outside of the, the barrier system that you're working within and then it affects your operators. But then technically what the, the guidelines state is that in a sterile manufacturing area where you're working with an aseptic product, you should be working in a positive pressure. 
uh, within the isolate. So we come under a bit of a um, a bit of a tough decision there, where where you have to really take this risk based approach and say, okay, what does this potent product mean to me? Uh, what does it mean to our operators? What kind of background room um, safety measures do we take into account? What sort of PPE is the operator wearing? And then overall, how are we running our process um, in order to achieve this? So one thing that we always say about isolators is that 50% of the work is done by the isolator, but then also 50% of the work is done by strong SOPs um, and development of the process by uh, usually in conjunction with a equipment manufacturer and the customer themselves. So if you want to move on to the questions and see what we've got going. So the top one on the list, if we are using a single use isolator, can we locate it in a non-classified area instead of a clean room? Yes, technically you can. Um, clean, not classified is, is usually an area, but it depends on the process that you're running. So if you look in EU GMP Annex 1, for instance, if you are conducting fill finish of a sterile product um, that needs to be run in an aseptic environment, so it's not going to be further filtered further down the line, you have to run a background of a grade C or D room. Realistically, you can't get away with that um, in any other situations with fill finish. However, if you're conducting other tests or other processes, maybe running um, toxicology batches, maybe running sterility testing, then you could perhaps run it in a clean, not classified area, um, as long as you are running the correct risk assessments with it. Are you still gaining your grade A sterile environments inside? Are you HEPA filtering the air that's coming into the isolator? Um, again, you have to take, um, you have to take all, these, all these risks into account. Um, so the next question, can you can such a system be fully compliant with current guidelines? Um, yes. So essentially, we when developing single use isolators uh, right from the beginning, um, we have stuck with current guidelines moving from the pharma industry. Whenever you're talking about potent materials, you know, following um, testing guidelines, maybe negative pressure air, airflow principles. And then when you come to the biopharmaceutical world, realistically, you're looking at much more stringent um, ways of working uh, with the FDA sterile manufacturing and the UGMP and the fact that these are injectable drug products, you know, going right into somebody's, um, somebody's system and bypassing you know, all your normal bodily defense functions, it really does need to be as clean as possible. Um, so realistically, yes, we've qualified uh, single-use aseptic isolators in exactly the same way as you would qualify a hard wall, stainless steel, big, um, fully automated system. You know, a lot of the technology that's come into this isolator or these isolated systems has been developed by people who worked in um, what could we say more conventional, um, more conventional um, isolated companies before this. So realistically, they've brought all those expertise into developing single-use systems. And realistically, all you're looking at is replacing the walls with a flexible film instead of a stainless steel, you know, outside shell. So realistically, the operation's the same, the, the fans, the valves, the filters, um, the control system, full, fully compliant 21 CFR control system, and you're just replacing the walls with the film. And then the handy part of that is the film is disposable, whereas you wouldn't want to dispose of all the stainless steel. Uh, so how do you make a whole single-use isolator? Good question. So basically, you can run with it two ways. You can either take a hybrid system where you will have um, part film and part stainless steel work surface. So essentially, all four walls around the unit and then the filter plenum above will all be connected. Um, and then the base of the unit will be stainless steel. Um, we have these really if people are placing... Um, heavier uh, pieces of process equipment on. And when um, uh, when you've got those heavier pieces of process equipment, you generally need a more sturdier base. And that's what we do that for. It just reduces the amount of cleaning validation needed because you can dispose of the HEPA filter above, you can dispose of the flexible film walls, just allowing yourself to leave with the, the cleaning of the base. Then what we do if you want a true single use system is we replace that stainless steel base with a plastic perforated work tray. 
So this plastic perforated work tray looks just like the inside of any normal isolator um, that you would see for sterile manufacturing, except it's disposable. So what we will do is we take that tray, we attach the film to the tray and to the filter at the top. Um, underneath that tray, you've got your exhaust filters that are also bonded to the plastic work tray. Then when you're finished with your activity, say if it's a potent sterile powder, for instance, where you can't clean, you don't want to risk exposure to your clean room, you just collapse the whole thing and then send it off for incineration. Um, all right, next question. How long does it take to set up the single-use isolate considering the connection to HVAC and other instruments, e.g. weighing scales? Um, so to set up one of the single-use uh, containment systems that we've got inside the aseptic isolator probably would take you no more than 20 minutes. Um, we've provided quite a lot of aids on, on the isolator. We've developed the standard system um, to allow you to install this isolator efficiently. Uh, the unit would be provided as a complete entity um, to start with, so you wouldn't have to connect the film to the filters or the base tray. We do all that for you and deliver it as a, as a package. And then we have some lifting actuators which come up from the, from the roof of the isolator, which will essentially lift the filter, the inlet filter into place. And then you simply slot the, um, the exhaust filter into a tray uh, on the base, push it in, turn the isolator on, and pretty much away you go. Um, the connection to the HVAC is constantly there. So if you can imagine, the, the isolator still has some stainless steel components. So it has a big top plenum where you keep all your air generating uh, fans and then the, the control valves. That's connected up to the HVAC in the room. Um, and then we essentially create our own you know, sort of HVAC system with inside the isolator in order to provide that grade A environment. Uh, setting up instruments, again, is really easy. We have cable bands um, that go through the side of the isolator, so you can connect in any power, um, compressed air lines for capping machines, or um, any sort of liquid feed lines that you need through water for injection, uh, connections from peristaltic pumps, anything like that. Uh, how do you transfer materials into the single-use isolator? So you have a few ways. So you've got some of the conventional methods. So a lot of people will use um, RTPs, for instance, rapid transfer ports or DTP ports, if you're using specific types. Uh, we can interface any of those with the isolator, um, anything from the small 105 ports right up until the larger um, sort of 350 diameter um, sterile transfer ports. And then those, again, have multiple connection methods for installing, um, you know, uh, drum systems into uh, sterile liquid connections, quick connects. Um, uh, you can use those to transfer items in. Uh, the isolator we develop comes directly with some small transfer ports, VHP gassing ports on the side, where you can fit in small amounts of equipment or vials. Um, if you're loading larger pieces of equipment into the isolator, you can use... Um, a transfer dedicated transfer isolator. So this is essentially just a, a square uh, flexible film uh, isolator with VHP gassing ports inside. We would put a VHP rack inside, so a, a piece of rack you could hang your equipment on, and then you would gas that. It doesn't have any airflow, doesn't need any airflow if you're not going to open the items inside, and then you will simply hook it up to the main system and then transfer your items through like that. You can keep a continuous process going because the transfer isolator can be technically gas separate from the main chamber. So as long as you're making that sterile connection before you do the transfer, then the materials can be transferred in a safe manner. Um, okay, the next question. Uh, I suppose safety and quality is the primary reason for a single-use isolator. However, have we considered the environmental impact and cost? Very, very good question. Yes. So there have been a, a number of studies done on this uh, this sort of element and, you know, with single use plastics being a big thing in the world at the moment and seeing how the impact on the environment stands. Realistically, um, kilo for kilo, um, incinerating single use plastics or running through this process is more environmentally friendly than uh, incineration of waste water. So what a lot of people don't realize is that when you are have a clean in place system on a stainless steel isolated system, you are creating a vast amount of waste water. Now that waste water generally is processed 
and then is incinerated. You know, it's not recycled, it's not reused. Once it's come into contact with potent drug products, that water has to be incinerated. And when you're going through these clean in place processes, you are generating kilograms over kilograms of waste water. Um, and that all has to be incinerated. And when you're going down the incineration route, everything is sort of pound for pound. So realistically, when you're disposing of our single use assembly, you're disposing of maybe 20 to 30 kilos of, uh, of a product, whereas you may have up to sort of 100 kilos of waste water if you're running over sort of an hour clean in place cycle. So realistically, the amount of energy and environment, <clears throat> environmental impact is realistically so much higher than um, with, with clean in place systems than it is with the single use plastics. And there have been a various map studies done on this to, to kind of prove the point. Uh, is there a standard solution slash example uh, using fully automotive, fully altered operation with robots within an isolator? Um, within our isolators, within the single use systems, we've not yet come across using uh, robotics. Uh, I know it's uh, uh, big in the in the system uh, in the in the field at the moment. There is a company which has developed a fully automated system with robots inside, zero human intervention. Um, amazing uh, technology, really, and. Uh, you know, I admire the guys that have done it. Um, however, from the feedback we've seen, and I don't want to badmouth them because it is a brilliant um, system, it's just a little bit slower. You can only handle one product at a time. You know, it's very careful, cautious. You know, you wouldn't be running anything high speed through it, multiple products. It's difficult to do changeovers. Um, so, you know, we see more conventional, maybe fully automated filling machines. Uh, where the vial stoppers, crimps are all loaded in manually, the, the product is loaded in manually, and then the, <clears throat> the fully automated system really runs itself. Um, but from, from a standpoint for us, you know, robotics hasn't really come into it um, that much, but it's honestly the future. You know, I do see robotics handling a lot. It takes a lot of the risk out of the process. As we know, risk comes from operators, and if we can engineer out uh, the solution, um, that's pretty much what the industry at the moment is, is looking to be going for. Um, okay, next question. How much does it cost per square meter of area in a positive pressure environment and what potential action and ways to reduce the cost? I'm not too sure what you're meaning by this question. Um, whether you're meaning the cost of operating a larger space or sterilizing a larger space, maybe. Um, you know, in order to do that. So I'm really not too, not too sure what that question means. Um, maybe you can just send me an email after and, uh, you know, expand on it a little bit more. Um, and then just finally, I'll touch on one quick question. Uh, methods of sterilization used for biodecontamination inside. Vaporized hydrogen peroxide is the main one. Uh, everybody uses it in the stainless steel systems. We use it in the film systems as well, fully compatible. You can run gassing cycles, no problem. And then we can also gamma irradiate our single use assemblies in order to provide you with a pre-sterilized enclosure um, for products that may be susceptible to BHP. Um, however, you will still need inbound gassing systems. So you will still need a transfer, sterile transfer of some sort. And that currently is, is VHP is the, pretty much the only method of, of making that sterile connection. However, there are new ways coming through of sort of uh, uh, UV light, for instance, there's, there's a company created a valve now with UV light. So, um, yeah, uh, I believe I'm out of time. So thank you very much. That was a lot of questions. That was really good questions. Thank you so much to everybody there. Um, if you have any other sort of things to talk about, any questions, you can message our team in Singapore. Um, a guy called Gavin Chu's emails down there. Gavin can help you out with any sort of questions you have. And then if he needs to loop me back in, then I'm more than happy to have a conversation with anybody about any sort of a septic sterile process involving um, containment systems. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.